Episode 6 is taken from Matthew chapter 1. Mary and Joseph talk. Husband and wife are together. Joseph is weak, but he still has the strength for a conversation. Mary is weary, but love keeps her focused. Mary, you don't need to talk, just rest. But I do. Well, take your time at least, I'll still be here. Don't you have to go? I don't have to go anywhere yet, not for a while. The food for the evening is already prepared. The two boys are off dealing with the livestock. They drew enough water this morning for the rest of the day and Miriam is scrubbing the kitchen from top to bottom. Her idea, not mine. So, we can just be together for a little while and enjoy each other's company. I'm not much company. You have always been my company, my most favourite company. You know that. Her hand is far warmer now than the pale, clammy skin across his forehead. It's nice when you touch my head. It's gentle. Don't stop. I won't. I was dreaming about the garden. Just now, when I came in, They both know which garden is meant. Yes, what I mean is, I wasn't dreaming, I was remembering dreaming. I didn't think you were quite asleep. Which dream? Do you mean the first dream, before he was born? Yes. Now that was a long time ago, nearly thirty years. It was a strange time, but then he is different from the rest. He, our son, our firstborn, is different from the rest of us. Do you know, sometimes I find it almost impossible to believe it all happened like that to us. And then sometimes it's as if it happened just the other day. It is real and then it isn't. Then it is, back and forth, you know. I had the first dream. Yes, you had the first dream, but I saw the first angel... Or was it rather I saw the angel first? Joseph makes an attempt to chuckle at her muddled thoughts. Mary acknowledges his weak response. I'm glad that made you smile. We may never know. Well, not never. One day, Joseph. Yes, one day. Mary waits for her husband's breathing to settle into steadiness once again. He is ready. In the garden, it was beautiful. The sky was clear and the trees were, well, they were trees. Now I've made you smile. The conversation takes time and Mary is patient in her listening and in her attention. Joseph continues. The angel told me not to be afraid. Yes, I know, rather important under the circumstances. In the garden, he sat down beside me, just like a person would, and I wasn't afraid, not after a while. Is that when he told you about me and the baby? Yes, Joseph whispers. He nods his chin just slightly. I knew you would be scared. Mary is soft in her reply. So was I, especially when I had to tell you and later when I couldn't hide it any longer. But you told me before, when we've spoken of this, that you weren't actually afraid of the angel himself. That's right. Though I suppose I was a little, I was mostly worried about you. All our plans going to waste. It was a horrible feeling. I don't want to remember. Hush, then don't. It's all right. Hold my hand. Mary is already holding his hand. Perhaps he can't feel it, so she makes an effort to grip it tighter. Yes, that's better. Now, he begins again. I want to tell you about the name. The name? The angel talked about the name for our son. Joseph struggles on. Ah, I thought that's what you meant. We have talked this through many times, you know. Do you really want to go through it again? It's important. I feel it is important. 
then tell me. You are to give him the name Jesus. That was the name. It was a lot to take in. I was to go ahead and marry my betrothed Mary, who was already pregnant and with a son. Joseph struggles to add volume to his words, and his voice trails off. Mary comforts him. Take your time, my dear, there's no hurry. And then the angel added, as if it were obvious, because he will save his people from their sins. I have never understood that, not properly. I know. Do you understand it then? No, I'm being honest. His name means the Lord saves, but I do not understand it, although I have a feeling. You have a feeling? Mm, I suppose that's what you could call it. But it's nothing clear that I can explain, and of course I could be quite wrong. <laughs> you are never wrong, my dear, never wrong. I'm glad to see you still have a sense of humour. That'll be the last thing to go. As the quip in his mind races to fall out of his mouth, words tripping over themselves, Joseph is plunged into a fit of coughing. All that coughing really takes it out of you, doesn't it? I think it's all this talking. We should stop. No, <clears throat> not yet, please. They sit in silence for a few minutes. It is not a, at all uncomfortable between them. And while they wait, Mary searches through her memories, finding pictures of her young husband again. Joseph breaks the spell. You see my feet down there? What, the old, those old things way down there? She laughs. Yes, I can see your feet. I can't feel them. No, no. Joseph halts his wife as she moves to attend to them, thinking that they must just be chilly. He explains, They're not cold. I just can't feel them. Oh, my love. Mary understands, but wishes she didn't, and tears, which always seem to be lurking just beneath the surface these days, bubble up. Don't you cry now. I need you up together. I need you to be strong. Suddenly, something else catches Joseph's attention. Listen. Mary sniffs. <laughs> what? What for? I can hear singing. It's very distant. Perhaps it's coming from somewhere in the village. I can't hear anything. Tell me more about the dream and the angel. What? Uh, oh, yes, the garden, the angel. A moment passes as in his mind the dream is restored. What the angel said sounded almost, almost wrong, you know? Mary repeats the phrase that between them was well worn. He will save his people from their sins. Joseph's voice is barely audible as he replies, No one can forgive sins except God. No one, only God. Yes, that is quite correct. And yet we falter at the angel's declaration, don't we? What did he mean? What does it mean even now for our son? This Jesus who has followed in your footsteps, he is just a carpenter from Nazareth. I suppose we could end up wondering whether it was all a mistake. Naturally, they both know the saying that nothing good can come out of Nazareth, and up to now they have nothing more to add to it, or, for that matter, to take away from it. No one can see the face of God, and yet, and yet. Joseph's train of thought veers off in another direction. He hasn't found a wife, our son. This is something else they both know. It is strange. I'm not sure he intends to. Mary's voice is thoughtful. There is something else planned for him. I think we both know that, don't we? But it's the shape of it, the outworking of it, that we don't understand. Our son Jesus is unlike everyone else we know. Ever since he was a little boy... Not everybody sees that. They say, he's just the carpenter's son. But we have known, haven't we, from the beginning, that he has been sent, given to us from God. 
Mary's grip on her husband's hand has become tighter and tighter as her words flow to support the insubstantial though genuine conviction in her heart. While Joseph senses the near entirety of doubt within his own. I cannot see how this will all end up and I'm afraid. I have been afraid many times in my life but being afraid about the very nature of our son has given me the most fear. Mary misunderstands. You are frightened of him? No, not of him, but for him. Their conversation hangs in the air, delicate strands of silk woven between them. After a while, Mary picks up a thread and continues. So many things I've hidden in my heart over the years, especially about Jesus. Many things, repeats Joseph. But what do we know for sure? What have we been told? What is certain? Both husband and wife sit in silence as they contemplate the certainty and uncertainty of many things. Can you lift my head up? Mary busies herself with finding more pillows and uses them to adjust her husband's position, raising his head as far as she can manage. The process is tiring for them both and she finishes by helping him to take a sip of water before he sinks back against the bolsters. While he is gathering his strength for more conversation, she strains her ears to listen for the singing that he mentioned. The only sounds she can distinguish are the squeals and shouts of children playing outside, the street vendors plying vegetables and fruit, calling for custom, and a couple of cockerels warming to the crowd. A stubbornly drawn-out sentence from her husband, who is lying on his deathbed at her side, draws her back into the room once again. We do know because of the angel sent by God. Joseph takes his time for fear he might lose hold of the friable thought. He continues, Why would God send an angel to tell us these things unless they were true? You are right, my love, so right. The angel visits, both to you and to me. They mean it will all be true. Now, tell me about the rest of the dream. Mary asks him, although it is a lot to ask, for two reasons. Firstly, because she knows it helps him to repeat the story. It fixes it firmly in both their minds. And secondly, because by hearing it again, she might be able to hold on to the dream and in the days ahead watch her son and perhaps even see the fulfilment, the truth of the things the angel has said. Jesus, their firstborn son, is working as a carpenter, following in his father's footsteps. He has been a child like no other, with goodness and purpose and extraordinary kindness, contrasting with the emerging characters of all subsequent children. At his birth there had been a steady march of further dreams and warnings, of angelic words, strange visitations and a flurry of prophecies. Until now, this is all they have to hold on to. Of course, there had also been that strange time some years later, on the Passover journey, when they had nearly lost him, and he had then told them something that didn't seem to fit. I must be about my father's business. However, their son has been a man now for more years than he has been a child, and any sign of fulfilment remains to be seen. They have watched his hunger and love of the scriptures develop, and yet surely he is about his father's business. He is a carpenter. Joseph is ready to talk once more. The angel walked with me through the garden. It was the clearest moment as if everything made sense. It was a dream, but it was as real, as real as you. Mary squeezes his hand and feels a slight response, at which she lifts it to her lips and kisses the pale parched skin. The angel talked about prophecies, the word from Isaiah, God with us. Emmanuel? Yes, Emmanuel, God with us. Then I woke up and it had been real. It was so real, undeniable. So I went ahead. 
and took me home to be your wife? Yes, it was straightforward, in my head, I mean. Joseph smiles. The recollection for them both is that it had been anything but straightforward. Mary shakes her head and sighs, half amused, half shaken at the memory. Those days were not easy days, with everyone thinking as they did, and yet, here we are. We survived. In fact, I think we have thrived, don't you? Joseph turns his eyes towards her, and the creases in each corner wrinkle with the effort of smiling. He dips his chin again in agreement. Across the floor, Mary watches a fat band of afternoon shadow as it is suddenly brought to prominence by a final blaze of sunshine outside. For a moment, it bids farewell to the blue and is once again hidden by cloud. She knows it will pass. In a few moments, the sun will emerge victoriously once more upon their little world as the cloud is hurried along by the conspiratorial breeze. All will be as it was, except for Joseph. Except for Joseph. Suddenly he speaks again. I took you home to be my wife, and I have never faltered from that decision. Suddenly Mary laughs. Do you remember how difficult that was, living in the same house but not being together together? Difficult? Oh, it was a monumental task. I feel quite proud of myself for not giving in. Was I such a temptation? Mary throws her head back with sudden laughter. You have no idea. She kisses her husband's hand. You were a good, good man, and you are one still. And the Lord honoured us and kept us safe. Even on the road to Bethlehem and in that animal shed, do you remember? Joseph nods, the recollection so clear. The first cries of their firstborn ringing in his ears, like the singing he heard just a moment ago. Mary offers her husband another sip of water, but he declines. They watch the dust in its slow dance through the air intent though dreamy in their gaze. However, they are both envisaging another scene. A dark night, crackling straw, an exhausted donkey squeezed in amongst the other livestock, the fear, the unstoppable process of birth, and Joseph's unpractised hands as he holds the freshly wrapped slippery infant in the cloths donated by the kindly stable owner. A million miles away in their minds, and yet so close to their hearts. Angels sang that night as if the heavens would explode, but who noticed that the Son of God had been born? And you gave him the name Jesus. The Son of God, that's who he is. Joseph's words slip out as if the heavens would explode once again. Although his speech is whispered and frail, it sings like the angels. I think that is so, my darling. Mary hesitates as she tries to order her words. That is the only explanation, though I feel almost as if it is no explanation at all. We have so little on which to base this truth. Perhaps God thinks we don't need much. He finds enough strength to squeeze her hand and then continues, An angel or two. Isn't that insignificant? It has so often been the way with them, one doubts, the other counters, and then the roles are switched about and the doubter becomes the encourager. Their relationship could not have been forged in any other way, as they alone had been chosen. They alone were privy to the birth and responsibility of God-made man. You know that I don't have long, don't you? I know, I know. She speaks as to a child, to comfort and banish fearful thoughts. However, the fearful thoughts are her own rather than her husband's, and she is the one who needs comforting. Joseph is quite peaceful now. He feels as if all pain has gone, as if he could rise up any moment full of vigour and life once again, and yet somehow he is drifting. There will be a new life, and it will be another life altogether. What I don't know 
is how to carry on without you. She leans in closer to her husband's still face. His skin resembles marble. It is beautiful and cold. What do I do without you? How will I know what to do about our son? How can I help him in this world if I don't have you by my side? Please don't leave me. Look, there he is. I can see him. An hour has gone by and Mary lifts her head. Dark red marks crisscross her face where she has been leaning on top of a pair of clasped hands, one now dead, the other alive. At her side is her daughter. This daughter is weeping and it is this not quite silent whimpering which has roused Mary from Joseph's deathbed. Her blinking eyes first see the two points at the end of the bed where his lifeless feet form the end of his body. This is the end of his body, his life on this earth, and a rolling, galloping surge of sorrow overtakes her. Joseph is gone. Joseph is gone. She can only wail, joining her daughter in a shiver of weeping. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us.